Hello, this is Jeff Weiscarver, and today we're going to be talking about a, an important topic to all of us, and that is uh, medical billing. Uh, the purpose of this particular presentation is intermediate medical billing, and there's some assumptions on the fact that it's an intermediate uh, session, and those assumptions are essentially that, that you have some basic knowledge or you may have attempted to bill medical and, and maybe haven't been entirely successful, so you want to learn more about it or maybe uh, you uh, haven't attempted, but you want to take a little deeper dive before you start. Um, but this is not a basic medical billing webinar. Um, and so if, uh, you know, by all means stay and learn, but I'm going to be assuming that you have a basic understanding of uh, med the medical billing process. So uh, specifically the topics today are going to be the diagnostic test and billing, preparing to submit a claim for the diagnostic test. Uh, and, and of course, if you've received a referral on a patient that's already been diagnosed, then clearly you don't need to uh, take these steps. But in many cases, especially the, the, for the folks that are in the DDME network, um, they do uh, kind of order their own tests. So uh, that will be very applicable for them. We're going to talk about codes, um, and, and the new codes are out. The CPT-10 was uh, released in October or November. Um, and uh, the billing houses are, are holding us to those new codes. So if you're not aware of the new codes and you've been getting denials, um, it could be that you're using the old codes and not the new codes for the diagnostic, uh, for the diagnosis. We're going to talk about uh, very specifically on documenting the, the test. It's really important that this be done in a very copious fashion because this is the part where things get hung up and you could even get paid for the test and then go back and submit a claim for therapy. And if something wasn't caught during the test and they catch it in the therapy of the test, they'll deny the therapy claim. So it's really, really important that we pay careful attention to the documentation trail that we create when we're submitting a claim both for the diagnostic test and for therapy. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the requirements associated with being able to build medical for an oral appliance. Uh, you can't just use any oral appliance. Those uh, appliances that we use to bill, E0486, have to have certain features and functionality, and we'll talk about those. Um, and then we'll talk about the document tra documentation trail for therapy. It's different. And one of the things that that's uh, kludgy, I will say, but it's the way it is, is that the group that you submit your claim to for the test is not the same group that you submit your claim to for therapy. And I know probably most of you on, the, on this call or listening to this uh, know that, but it is, um, you know, just the way they categorize the two uh, uh, parts to this, uh, there are different groups. And then we're going to finish up with appealing uh, a claim that's been denied. So um, most of us, if not all of us, that have attempted to bill uh, medical have been denied, uh, especially when you're just learning. So we're going to talk about some techniques for a billing a claim, and, and uh, so we'll spend some time on that. Um, and then last thing, excuse me, it's not listed there, but if you want to um, get some coaching on um, billing medical insurance, uh, we'll, uh, I have some recommendations in that area for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, very important information, sleep apnea, and you know, if you know this, great, it'll reinforce what you already know, and if you don't know this, you got to learn it because you won't get far if you don't. So sleep apnea is a medical condition and needs to be diagnosed by physicians. I think most people that are listening to this are, are, are know that, but that has implications that aren't so obvious. Um, the physicians drive the entire process and, and the dentists provide a service associated with a physician diagnosed disorder. That's the way I think of it. So the physicians also control the therapeutic recommendations. So the dentist can't say, I think you should do an oral appliance, and that's good enough. For the purpose of billing insurance, that order needs to come from a physician. Okay, very, very important. Um, therapy for OSA, whether it's CPAP, surgery, or uh, oral appliance, falls under a category of insurance called DME, Durable Medical Equipment. And as such, uh, there's some implications for that as well, and that is you have to have a DME license. And so uh, Medicare uh, gives those out, um, and there's a process. And this gets a little confusing because Medicare kind of issued you guys a number 
already, but that's not the number we need for to be a DME provider. So that's a separate number. Uh, most of you have probably already at least started this, and many of you have probably already completed that, that process of obtaining your DME license. Um, a lot of people say, what's up with the name DADME? What, what, what is that? And um, because it's applicable in today's webinar, I just thought I'd share with you, uh, it, uh, DDME stands for Dental Durable Medical Equipment. So that's, if you've ever were curious as to what that name stood for, uh, that's what it is. And um, to receive uh, private or public insurance, you have to get that number. That DME number is required. And because it's issued by Medicare, people a lot of times will say, oh, I don't want to do Medicare patients. Well, that doesn't matter. You have to have a DME license. Just because it's issued by uh, Medicare doesn't mean that you have the option of not doing it. You can opt out of Medicare and not treat Medicare patients, but if you want to bill medical insurance, you have to have a DME license. Okay? Um, I put a little note here. Um, you know, for, for the insurance plan to include coverage of oral appliance therapy, um, they need to contact contract with you. Uh, the physicians uh, can't make an oral appliance. So these insurance payers, I, I just, you know, the reason I say this is because there's a lot of dentists that would do this if it weren't for billing medical insurance. But if you understood that medical insurance needs you, the dentist, you might have a more uh, uh, confident approach in taking this on, even though it is quite a bit of work. Uh, getting your DME license and so forth. So uh, just at the end of the day, the insurance payers need you. And I think that sometimes gets lost in all the, the rigmarole that, that goes on with building medical insurance. Okay, so um, first and foremost, we need an MPR number. You all have that already. Uh, CMS is going to, this is kind of the number sometimes I think people get confused with. I already have an MPI number. So, uh, but the MPI number is different from your DME license number. So they're two completely separate items. So you do need both. So at the end of the day, um, you need to have your MPI number and your DME license to bill medical, all right? Uh, there's some websites there to clarify this if, if you have some uh, more questions or want more detailed information on it. Um, Medicare enrollment form. So do you, if you do wanna treat Medicare patients, uh, there's a process, uh, you know, there's a form to fill out. You fill that out and you become a, a provider for Medicare, okay? So that's uh, the information, the form number is there. But again, I believe most of you, if you're in the intermediate course here, you've probably already filled that one out. If not, we have that uh, application uh, if, you want it, if, you, if you want it from us. Um, Okay, so we're going to uh, start now with billing for the test. So that is you, you have a patient in your practice um, and they have not been referred to you already diagnosed. So obviously if they're already diagnosed, somebody's already done that for you. It's probably a sleep lab or somebody else that has the ability to diagnose you and the patient shows up with a diagnosis. Okay, we're not talking about that scenario. The scenario we're talking about is you've identified a patient in your practice and for one reason or another you believe they're at risk for having sleep apnea and may benefit from uh, treatment of apnea with an oral appliance, okay? So we're talking about the document trail in that situation, okay? So uh, step one is uh, why, are, why do you believe this patient would benefit from being treated for sleep apnea? Um, and you can't say, well, I just think that's the way I think they would benefit. You have to have a reason and you have to document those reasons. And, and those reasons need to be consistent with what payers accept as reasons to do a test. All right. So uh, this is where sometimes there's some confusion because there's now two reasons to do an initial consultation. One, your patient, for one reason or another, um, says, I, I need some help in this area, and you want to actually learn more about the clinical reasons why that's the case. Um, do they snore? Are they tired during the day? Um, has anybody witnessed pauses in breathing? Do they fall asleep while driving? There's kind of all these compelling reasons. But on top of those reasons, now we need to align that with some of the billing requirements. And so you can collect all this really critical uh, clinical information, and in doing so, you're, you, you, know, you collect that information. I'm not saying don't collect that, 
but in addition to that, there may be, there might be other information you need to collect, not for the purpose of building up the clinical case, but for satisfying the requirement to bill medical insurance. Um, so uh, the I'll give you some examples of of what those requirements are, and you build in those requirements into your intake of your patient. Okay. So, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're very big, very big in California. Um, they really like the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, which assesses patients' uh, um, excessive daytime sleepiness, EDS. Um, so there's, you can't just say, my patient's tired. You have to provide some type of document that has assessed their ability to, to stay awake during the day. And one of the most popular ways to... Uh, provide that uh, uh, information is through the EPOR sleepiness scale. And it's a series of questions that just ask you to scale from one to three, what's the likelihood that you would fall asleep in any particular situation. And I'm going to provide you with some examples of uh, an, an intake that includes that EPOR. Um, and, uh, you know, just a little side note about the EPOR is that some people don't like it. Some people say, well, it's not that great of a questionnaire. And, it's, you know, it's, there's probably questionnaires out there that are better. Um, and you feel free to use those questionnaires. But in addition to that questionnaire that you would prefer, if your payer likes the Upwork and wants to see it when you submit your claim for the test, use the Upwork. Okay? Just save yourself the grief. Don't try to train payers on your great um, questionnaire. They don't want to learn from you. Okay? I've been guilty of that. You know, I've called and wasted my breath saying, oh, listen, there's better questionnaires out there. They don't want to hear that. They want the Upwork and they want to score. And when you when we talk about the Upwork, there is some specific coaching that I, I recommend when you're talking to your patient when, they, when they're in the process of filling it out. Um, okay, so again, uh, adjust your intake. So as, as you learn, so that, you know, that's the Blue Cross Blue Shield. Payers in your area, they may have a different questionnaire, or they may have the Epworth and they may want something else. So it's important to find out what the requirement is in your area. And, and for all the, the, the specific information that I'm providing you, just know that there's always exceptions to the rule and there's different rules in different regions and different payers. But they're, they're fairly consistent in the theme and reason for the rules. So, for example, if they don't use the Upwork, they might use some other questionnaire that assesses sleepiness. So just, you'll have to find that out uh, from your payer. So finding out about your payer, that's the next slide here. Um, the Cigna. So Cigna and, is not unique, and, and payers have their uh, policies and procedures for accepting claims on a given topic. So on this particular topic, you can see there it's obstructive sleep apnea diagnosis and treatment services. And they, uh, each uh, payer has rules, and these are fairly substantial documents. This is a table of contents, and look, this one um, item, this one topic has a 40-page uh, procedure on just sleep apnea, all right? And moreover, Cigna West Coast might be different from Cigna East Coast, so you have to uh, be aware of that. And, and if you haven't noticed, you might notice that the date on these are old. I've had these slides for a while, so I'd probably be better, good idea for me to update that. But make sure that the guidance that you receive on the payers in your area on sleep apnea diagnosis and treatment, one, it's a, it's a relevant policy because if you Google, you can come up with an old document. Um, call the payer. Say, listen, can I get your latest policy and procedure on covering sleep apnea and its treatment? Um, and then get familiar with the rules, all right? So in this case, like, you know, bariatric surgery, they cover that. They cover all kinds of surgeries. Um, so you just, at the end of the day, just know what the rules are. Um, here's another one for Anthem. I think Anthem um, has been folded into a couple other groups recently. <coughs> Excuse me. But Again, this is another sample of obtaining the specific information on the payer in your area. You need to get these documents, okay, and become familiar with them. Uh, they have very important information, and, and the information becomes really important when you're if if you find yourself in the situation where you have to appeal a, a denied claim. Okay. All right. Next slide here. 
Um, so we're going to talk about um, all payers require some type of intake, some type of documentation that as a result of learning something about the patient, you suspect that they have a, a, a medical condition. In this case, we're talking about sleep apnea. And um, so we're, the, the next few slides are we're going to be talking about documenting uh, the uh, uh, likelihood that the patient has sleep apnea. So on, on this page, what you're looking at is an initial consultation. So uh, you guys already do this for your, all your patients. I know that you have intakes on new patients. And um, you may probably, again, because this is an intermediate course, you, you've probably already implemented some type of documentation that's similar to what you're looking at now. But I, I do want to explain there's two components to the intake. There's one component that you, it's essentially a questionnaire filled out by the patient and turned into you. That's component one. Component two is you, the clinician, has interviewed face-to-face -face a patient and filled out the, the uh, questionnaire. So that's, that provides support, one, that you have had a face-to-face -face visit with your patient. And as a result of that face-to-face -face visit, you filled out some information, and, and that information indicates that your patient has a high likelihood of having sleep apnea. So let me kind of go over what the specifics are of that. Um, on the upper right-hand corner, you can see here, um, there's this, uh, the Epworth sleepiness scale. I've already talked about that. Um, your patient fills that out, and you end up with a score, all right? And the number that most payers are looking at are nine or 10, okay? If they have a score of zero, that questionnaire says they're not tired during the day. So you can say they're tired during the day and your patient can tell you they're tired during the day, but when they fill out this Epworth scale and it's two, payers are gonna say they're not tired during the day, all right? So when you're talking about the Epworth to your patient, it's a good idea to just mention, say, listen, how this works is um, your payer is going to assess whether or not you qualify for this benefit based on this score. And the higher the score, the more likelihood is you're going to be able to take advantage of the benefit. Okay. And the reason you, and you, you don't want to tell them specifically to give themselves a high score, but you want to let them know how it works. Okay, because a lot of times patients tend to minimize or deny what they're feeling just because they don't want to be portray themselves as, as too severe. I know I do that when I go to the doctor, and I think all of us do that. Um, in this scenario, though, if, if you fill this out and you say, oh, I've never dozed off, and you have, um, then you give yourself a zero, and you give yourself enough zeros, they're going to say, geez, we don't see the medical necessity for this. All right. So when your patients are filling this out, just make sure they understand what their what the purpose is that they're filling out is that that the higher the score, the more likely that they, they'll be able to take advantage of the benefit. OK. Um, now, I have two examples of at the bottom part of the screen. There is the Mellon Patty and the Stop Bang. Uh, you can use either or both. Uh, and um, what what those do is those provide further uh, evidence that your patient's likely to have sleep apnea. So there's uh, some uh, the class bites, the malum patties. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Um, if you can't see the tonsils, you know that's probably a problem. Um, and the stop bang is is just a series of questions or um, results, and based on that, if you score a certain amount, then you have a high likelihood of having sleep apnea, and uh, a ordering a test is warranted. Um, with regards to patient symptoms, so this is you asking your patient, do you snore, yes or no? Are you tired during the day, yes or no? Anybody notice you have pauses in breathing? Do you have heart disease? Um, and at the end of this, if there's enough yeses, you have a high enough score on the Epworth, and your BMI and everything adds up, you, you kind of get a picture that your patient is has a high likelihood of sleep apnea. That's what the payers are looking for. What they're wanting to avoid is somebody ordering a test because they want to or because their patient ordered them a test. The, the purpose of this is to drive a series a, a process by which you assess your patient what's the likelihood that they have sleep apnea. That's the purpose of this. Okay. 
It, you know, a lot of people sometimes think the purpose of it is to be able to deny the claim, and that's not really the case. The case is payers want to make sure that you're just not ordering tests for no reasons. Okay. All right. Uh, so you filled out the questionnaire, and now you want to uh, place an order for the test. Um, and this is where you'll probably collect the, the, the patient's insurance information, uh, their group number, their policy number, uh, some basic information, uh, the MPI number or the ordering doctor. Um, and, and you can actually provide this for physicians that want to order a test through you. So a lot of times... Uh, primary care or patients' doctors don't want to go through the hassle of performing the test because, one, maybe they don't have the equipment, or two, maybe, you know, the way the physician office is, they don't want to get bogged down in something like this. So they would much prefer to have you do the test rather than them do the test. So this would be an order form that you might receive from a physician, or this might be your order form. So at the end of the day, you need to have, fill out an order and uh, um, put, uh, put a check next to the code or symptoms that are appropriate for the patient, okay? So this is the actual order. All right, so now you have an initial consultation and an order and the next step uh, and the patient's uh, in information. So the next step in this process is you want to obtain a pre-authorization, pre-approval um, before you actually perform the test. Uh, some payers don't require it. Uh, some do. So you'll find out when you call and they'll say, oh, no, pre-authorization is required. Or they may say, uh, your pre-authorization number is, but we're still not going to guarantee you're going to get paid, but here's the number. Um, but I think the most important reason to call for a pre-authorization or pre-approval is to find out the status of the patient's uh, benefit. So the conversation that you need to have with your patient is um, how much is gonna, are they going to have to pay? And you really can't answer that question unless you contact the payer and find out, one, is there a deductible met? If it is, great. If it's not, how much? Um, if it's, you know, under two or $300 um, on what they met, then by ordering the test, that will finish off their deductible in the next um set of uh, services that the patient gets will be covered under the under their under their insurance patients are aware of this so if, if they have a two thousand dollar deductible which is unfortunately not unusual and they have put in uh 1750 let's say so they have uh, 250 left before they've met their deductible then submit the claim for 250 and say listen good news and bad news um, the test is going to be 250 out of pocket but that's going to finish off your deductible and services moving forward for the rest of the year will be paid out at whatever your benefits are. Okay, so you can have that conversation with your patient, even if you have to inform them that they have to pay for the test out of pocket. Um, and the answer, so so then there's the deductible. The other part is, it, is it like a PPO where it's like an 80-20 plan? So... Even if they've met their deductible and it's an 80-20 plan, they're still going to have to pay 20%. So if you charge $250 for the test, 20% uh, of that is $50, bucks, so they're going to have to pay $50 for the test. All right? Um, if you're out of network, which most of us are, uh, that where that comes into play here is that split. So if you're in network, it might be 80-20. If you're out of network, it's 50-50. Okay? So the way the medical insurance environment is, there's a lot of pressure on payers to weed out or minimize or reduce or eliminate out-of-network expenditure. Okay, so just be aware of that. There are some benefits to being out-of-network, but those benefits are fading. So you, you do want to try to get in-network when you can. If you're out-of-network, um, just know that the effect on you and your patient is that the benefit is usually less for out-of-network out benefits, okay? Okay, so you've received your pre-authorization number. You know what the uh, financial um, responsibility of your patient is. You've let them know, and they've decided to do the test. Go ahead and do the HST. Uh, when you finish collecting the data, uh, you must have that data interpreted by a 
board certified sleep doc. Um, if it's a Medicare patient, you're going to have to refer that patient to a physician. Okay, Medicare does not pay for dentist ordering tests. It's just the way it is. Uh, Medicare patients have to be seen face to face by a board certified sleep physician or a physician trained in sleep. Okay, um, that's just the way it is. So, barring Medicare, um, you do the test. Say uh, the patient agrees. You, you've done a a uh, an interpretation or you've received an interpretation from a board certified sleep physician and uh, we provide that service at DDME so uh, those of you that are in our network know this and it's you just order uh, an interpretation via email and, and we take care of that for you um, you in a day or two you get back from the physician a diagnosis and treatment recommendations okay so then you have one of the elements or one of the documents that you're going to need to submit the claim for the test and for therapy. So that diagnosis gets involved both in the test and the, and, and the therapeutic uh, reimbursement decision. Um, when you do the test, it could be that you learn that the patient needs to get referred to a sleep lab. That's, that's the, that happens. Some patients are too severe for an oral appliance or they have some other medical issue or medical comorbidity that precludes them from you uh, fabricating an oral appliance for their apnea and as a result then you just have to refer them out and uh, you're doing your patient a tremendous service uh, but the service you won't be providing is making them an oral appliance at least at that, that point in time okay but the point is you have a document that you review with your patient and that document was generated by a board certified sleep doc that says yes you have sleep apnea and here's what I recommend okay so We've talked about a couple of cases where the patient gets referred out. So that happens about 10% of the time. So let's talk about the 90%. So the 90% of the time, uh, the physician, at least the ones that we use, assuming it's appropriate, will recommend an oral appliance. So then um, there's, that's going to trigger some activity. So we're going to talk about that. All right. Um, the activity is we need to get an order for the oral appliance. So now the patient's been diagnosed and, and a treatment recommendation's been made. The, the physician that's made the treatment recommendation, that's not the patient's physician. That's a trained sleep specialist, not the patient's primary care physician. We at DDME strongly recommend that you involve the patient's physician in this process. And one of the reasons is that it's gonna help you bill medical insurance Another reason is it makes great clinical sense because we're treating a medical condition and the patient's primary care should know that. And three, it's actually a marketing opportunity for you, the dentist. So when you interact with your patient's primary care physician or their regular doctor, um, you can say, hey, listen, I, I treat patients and I diagnose patients or, you know, I have patients um, get diagnosed and I, I manage the process, so if it's something, it's a, if that's a service you as a physician would appreciate, here's my order form, and I showed you that order form a couple of slides ago. Okay. So what we're looking at here is two documents that you want to send to your patient's physician for the purpose of that physician ordering an oral appliance. And when I say ordering, it's a prescription. Okay. So in order to get any type of DME coverage, uh, it's not unlike CPAP or oxygen or anything along those lines. You have to have a prescription for that. And this is the prescription. So uh, one of the cool things that we do at DDME is we have this report and it combines the prescription um, with the diagnostic or therapeutic code and the diagnostic code and a letter of medical necessity. Okay, so a physician needs to, to sign a letter of medical necessity a physician needs to sign the prescription, so we combine both documents, and it's a report that's available in our software. So you print out that report. It could be easy. You go to report, click form, RX2, and this, this gets printed up for you. And you take that document that I just told you about, plus the board-certified sleep physician's diagnosis, you fax those two documents to your, your patient's physician and say, please sign this and I'll take care of it. Uh, sometimes the physician's going to want to see the patient. Most of the time they won't. Okay? 
So then you'll get a fax back from the physician, from your patient's doctor with a sign, signed prescription. And guess what? You're going to be calling for pre-authorization again. So this is our second go around, but it's going to be with a different group. So in the way payers are divided up, there's the medical diagnostic benefits and then there's the DME benefit. The DME benefit group is a different group. So there's probably a different number to call. There's going to be a different co uh, group number to refer to. Um, and there's going to be a brand new set of information uh, based on the patient's benefit. And by that, I mean what's going to be the patient's uh, responsibility. Okay, so that's a, going to be a completely set of, of new circumstances. So you might have an 80-20 plan on the test and a 70-30 on the DME or 50-50. Or some patients don't have any DME benefit. You know, so you just have to, this, these are the things you'll find out. So most people have, if you have medical insurance, you have DME benefit. But there is those that don't. So just, just so you know, I just meant that kind of as, a, as an example that just because you get 80-20 on the test doesn't mean you get 80-20 on the, on the oral appliance. Okay, so you make that phone call, you, you get the information you need. Uh, again, they may say no pre-authorization or pre-approval needed, or they may give you the number uh, if it is required. And then again, get the patient responsibility. Find out what is gonna be out of pocket for the patient. And this is gonna be a little bit more touchy subject because it's a lot more money. So now we're talking thousands of dollars instead of hundreds. And depending on the patient's benefit, this may be bad news, it may be good news. You know, if we're talking about uh, services provided in December um, and their deductibles covered and they have a good plan, it could be very little out of pocket for the patient. Uh, unfortunately, more and more, it's gonna be uh, some from the patient and some from the plan. So you just have to figure out what that split is and then let the patient know your part of this is X dollars and your benefit is X dollars and then they can uh, make the decision to proceed or not. So let's assume they've made the decision to proceed. Um, uh, and this, okay, so let me, let me talk about this subject here um, because it's gonna connect back up in just a second. Um, you may get a referral from a patient who has failed CPAP. Okay, so they already have the benefit. The, the benefit's already been uh, approved. Uh, they tried CPAP, it didn't work. Um, and so plan B is an oral appliance. Okay, so you're receiving this referral from somewhere. Um, in that scenario, you need to get an affidavit of intolerance or something, some type of letter that states the patient is intolerant to CPAP, an attempt was made and it failed and list the reasons for the failure. And that document should be signed by both the patient and the physician that ordered the CPAP originally. Okay, so this is, this is gonna be a third document that the payer is gonna to wanna to see in this particular scenario where it's a CPAP failure. And the scenario that we started with, uh, it's not a CPAP failure, it's just a patient that was diagnosed and it was decided that an oral appliance was the best first option. In this scenario, CPAP was the best first option, but it did not work, okay? So in order to go down the oral appliance path, you need some type of affidavit indicating that the patient's not tolerant of CPAP, okay? All right, so now we're gonna connect back up. So in either scenario, CPAP failure or you've, di uh, you've had the patient diagnosed, um, it's time to, to do what we're kind of the step one. I think in a perfect world, this would come much earlier in the process, but this is the world we live in you take an impression, all right? So the patient's agreed to the financial arrangements. They've been diagnosed by a physician. Their primary care doctor agrees that this is the best thing. So you as the dentist kind of running this program um, have two physicians that are backing you up, a board certified sleep doctor and the patient's physician are both standing behind you on this. And it's important that your patient understand that. So I always you know, recommend people you know, because this is an expensive decision for the patient and they really need to be supported or, you know, keep the interest level high because this could be, it's, it's probably the most expensive thing in the whole entire process. So you say, listen, a specialist recommended and we all agree, your physician and me as a dentist that specializes in this area, 
the three of us agree this is the best thing. Okay, this is what we need to do. Um, and, and this goes a little bit counter to other things that dentists do. And the thing that's different, one of the primary differences between medical and dental is if you're at a cardiologist and, and you're uh, at risk for having a heart attack, patients are all ears. Whatever you want me to do, doc, I'll do. Okay, that's not the scenario with dentists. You know, dentists, you're selling. You're providing service. And so it's a little bit different take. And But at the end of the day, if we're treating sleep apnea, it's the same life-threatening disease. So the, the line that gets a little bit tricky is, as a dentist, how assertive do you want to be in convincing the patient that they need to do this? Because a lot of times you guys know more than me. Oh, yeah, I'll do an oral appliance. Okay, well, it's $2,200. Oh, I don't want to do an oral appliance. Okay. Well, so then what do you do as a dentist? Okay, so then there's a conversation that you need to have, and that, that's where I say, listen, we have two physicians and myself who's highly trained in this area that all believe that you need to do this. I know it's expensive. We have care credit that can help you out. We can pay over time. But you really need to do this because the consequences for not doing it are very high. You know, there's health consequences um, to untreated sleep apnea, and they're known. And uh, because you've been diagnosed and you're uh, refusing medical treatment, I'm actually going to have to have you sign a document saying you're refusing medical treatment. You, you, you know, that, that's a very assertive path. You might not be comfortable being that assertive. But know that that, that that is a difference. I mean, it's not teeth whitening we're talking about. We're talking about treating sleep apnea, right? So that this is where uh, communicating that difference usually comes up when the patient has to write a large check, okay? And that's where you have to be compassionate but assertive in convincing the patient they need to proceed. All right, so you've taken your impression and uh, you got your appliance back from the lab and you're, you're fitting your patient. You're doing your, their initial fitting. Um, so the date of service that is typically accepted by most payers is that initial fitting, okay? So when you get the appliance back from the dental lab, and you schedule that appointment with the patient and say, hey, listen, we have uh, received your appliance. Let's get you in and let's get you fitted. Uh, when you fit the patient for the appliance, that's data service. So when you're, um, filling, or when you're compiling your documentation to submit a claim for the therapy for E0486, uh, the last little bit of information that you typically will need is the data service because the data service is complete the next day you can file your claim, okay? Now, you're not done working, obviously, with the patient because you have the titration process and you need to manage the side effects and symptoms and so on and so forth, but for the purpose of submitting the claim, the data service is typically when you fit the patient for an appliance and, and uh, very, very important data service. Um, the thing that, that a lot of dentists don't realize is that it is actually in some ways easier to bill for an oral appliance medical insurance than CPAP. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. For CPAP, it's required that the patient try CPAP. And uh, there's a period of time, I believe it's 90 days. And after 90 days, if they're still wearing it, then you submit the claim. Okay. Um, and in that 90 day period, at any point in time, the patient says, no, I can't deal with that. The, C the DME, uh, not you, the DME, the DME that provides CPAP, um, they're kind of out of luck. They're going to get that CPAP back and they're not going to get paid. With you, when you fit your appliance and uh, successfully complete the data service and you submit the claim, that's the, you don't have that same um, uh, compliance requirement that CPAP has. So in some ways, it's, you know, you, because you don't have that compliance requirement, it's better. It's, it's simpler. Okay. So, um, the code is E0486-NU. A lot of people forget to say NU, and this just stands for a new appliance. Um, a code that is also available is E0486-RP, and that's for repair. So, you know, if for one reason or another, you have to have some type of repair. There is codes for that. Um, depending on the pair, you may not get paid for that, but you can submit the claim, and then that becomes an out-of-pocket expense. And if... For no other reason, whatever you charge your patient to fix their appliance, if it's not a warranty job, 
um, goes towards their deductible. So you might say, well, geez, there's no dollars on Dash RP. Um, but if you submit the claim and you collect 250, that's just that much less money the patient has to pay on their deductible. So that, that's just almost a favor you're doing for your patient. Um, there are some other codes. Um, evaluation and management codes are listed there. Uh, Medicare doesn't pay for those, but a lot of private payers do. Um, I did. The, there's some codes on here I didn't put on because I just wasn't comfortable with the knowledge that I have. But in certain circumstances, medical insurance will pay for x-rays. Um, in certain circumstances, they won't. Um, so because I, I just wasn't completely comfortable, but if you want, you can attempt to submit the reimbursement for, for x-rays and see how it goes. Um, okay, so you've done your data service, you've fit, completed your 1500 form. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I'm gonna go back for a second. Um, the 1500 form is the form that gets submitted for uh, insurance uh, payers to assess the claim, the validity of the claim. Um, the links there, and uh, if you want this uh, information, the PowerPoint that I'm using for this presentation, um, shoot me an email, and I'll be very happy to provide that for you. Or just go to the just Google 1500 form, and and you'll 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 go to the same website. Okay. Um, all right, but I think probably most of you already are using those. All right, so let's talk about um, appealing a denial. Okay, so. Uh, especially when you're learning, um, it's it's important to, to have the appropriate expectation of how this is going to go if you're new to billing medical insurance. Um, it's extraordinarily rare that your first claim goes through perfectly. Um, but I've heard that that happens, but then the second and third claim doesn't go through. So... Um, just know that there's, you know, once you, let's say you did everything that I said to the letter, you submit a claim and it's denied. Um, so let's talk about what you do next. First of all, the person that, that you're going to get a phone number saying your claim was denied for some very generic reason. And there's usually not enough information on that reason for the denial to be able to start the appeal. So you're going to have to make a phone call. In the course of that phone call, your number one goal is to make a new friend, okay? The person that you're gonna call is gonna have to make a decision on your behalf at some point. And if you call and you have an attitude and you're irritable and frustrated, and that person kind of just has to decide, well, should I do this or not? If you're kind of a jerk, you can imagine how that decision's gonna go. If you call and you say, listen, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit new to this. Um, I got a denial. I think I know what the problem is, but I want to confirm with you. And I really would appreciate your help in, in working through this issue with me. You know, if you, if you kind of take that approach, um, your chances of successfully completing the, the, the uh, appeal goes way up. Because despite popular um, uh, perception, People and insurance are people. There are human beings there, and they have a responsibility to make sure that their uh, members get taken care of. That's their job, and their job isn't necessarily to make your life difficult. Their job is to take care of their benefits and take care of their members. All right? So if you have that, that proper understanding of what their job is and you're a little bit humble and call them and say, listen, I'd like to learn how to do this so I don't have to bug you anymore, um, You'll be amazed at how that goes. So develop a relationship with the people that you have to call when you're when you're um, appealing a claim. When you're on the phone with them, get really specific because it's going to say something like uh, no out-of-network benefit available or something even less specific than that. Um, and then they'll look it up and then they'll they'll see, oh, okay, I see maybe it was, wasn't coded properly or maybe there wasn't enough support for medical necessity or something along those lines. And then you can say, listen, I, I thought I submitted uh, an Epworth. And you say, yeah, you have the Epworth, but there's two other bits of information that didn't support the medical necessity. And you say, oh, what are those? And whatever they say is gold because what you provided didn't work and they're going to tell you what they need, okay? So when you're, when you're learning that, when you're going through that process, 
the um, when you ask a question and they look at some they look something up and then they start talking you should have your pen out and take very careful notes and be prepared to make an adjustment to how you file your claim because I tell you what if you if that person sees that you on their next claim they see that you made the adjustment based on the information they provided they know they're dealing with a player they know they're dealing with somebody that's serious about this and th th you're going to have a lot more latitude in their perspective when they see something from you. They're going to say, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, they did make that change. There's this other problem, but you know what? I'm going to just let that go. I'll give them a call and say, I'm going to let it go, okay? If you're a jerk and you're irritable and this is your third try, they're going to, believe me, they're, they have the power and they know it. And if... If, if it's not gone well, um, if they can get away with not, not helping you, they will. They won't help you, okay? <clears throat> At the end of the day, your goal is to learn how to do this without any hiccups, okay? And my final guidance on this is persistence wears down resistance. So you might appeal a claim. They say, oh, yeah, you did fix that. Congratulations. Well, the next problem is, oh, yeah, you fixed the first two items. The next problem is... You might have to go back two or three times on the same claim. Pretend like it's the first time every time. Oh, God, you're so helpful. Well, I, you know, I, I hate to bug you. I, I know I've burned a lot of your time here. What's the thing that I need to do on this one last thing? And I, I, I can assure you that I'll make that change. Okay? Or are you going to be, you know what, well, you guys are jerks because now this is the third time. You should have just told me all three problems the first time. Okay? Like, just be aware that, that that's important, that, you know, your attitude on the phone with them is important. And at the end of the day, if you've got a friend over there, you know their name, you know something about them, believe me, it will pay dividends. Okay? All right. So um, that's kind of, you know, the, the basics of my talk. I, I'm going to give you a little bit more information on a generic level. Uh, I mentioned that the CPT codes are out. They've been out for a, little, you know, a couple of months now. Um, we have available uh, kind of a map. Um, the old code and the code that old code was replaced with this new code. Um, so that's available. It's listed here. There's a couple of slides that have the new codes. Um, so just be aware of that. That's available. That's new. Um, sleep appliances. There are some rules on uh, what sleep appliances are going to be reimbursable because that's that could be a claim a reason why a claim gets denied is you didn't use the proper appliance and so there are some appliances that get used um, they uh, like the Moses for example there's a problem with the Moses um, maybe it's not adjustable or there's the EMA so I, I want to go through and make sure everyone understands that the um, there are some, some rules. So real quickly, uh, it needs to be customized, and Boil and Bite is not customized. I know there's a, a new category of emerging appliances that are very inexpensive. They're made chair-side. Um, don't try billing medical sleep apnea for uh, these Boil and Bite types of appliances. Um, one, of most of them, that's not their intention. Um, two, uh, they don't meet the requirement, okay? Uh, the, so when they say customized, that means it's fabricated at a lab based on an impression, not boil and bite. Even though boil and bite is kind of customized, that's not what the letter, the spirit of the customized is dictated by payers. They want an, an impression sent to a lab. That's why they say customized. It needs to be adjustable on a max one millimeter increment. Most um, appliances are less than a millimeter. You can turn a screw. You could have minute uh, adjustments on a lot of them, uh, but you can't have more than one millimeter at a time adjustment. There's just too much risk with causing side effects. Um, and the whatever the recommended percent protrusive or millimeter or whatever, however it is you monitor change is, is per percent protrusive, that whatever it is that spot is, that spot needs to be fixed. That is, it, you don't have to undo it every morning or you, can, you should be able to clean the appliances without undoing whatever that setting is. So it has to be a fixed, stable setting, okay? All right. 
Um, before I we we go, there's two things. One, at first, I want to thank you for taking the time to review this information. It's my hope that you're successful at this. And the reason that we invest our time in this is because uh, the more successful you are at treating patients, the more services that you'll order from DDME. So one of the aspects of our business model is by us helping you be more successful, uh, you help us be more successful. And it's kind of a, a nice relationship. Um, there's a certain amount of benefit from this um, from this webinar. And I don't mean to minimize that, but uh, you may require a, a little more specific coaching on this in this area. So your biller or you, the dentist, may say, geez, that's great, but I, I want to sit down and is, you know, one on one with somebody who has successfully done this. And um, a recommendation that I would like to make is Dr. Susan Haley, who is a dentist. She's been very successful at transitioning her practice. She's doing, I don't know, God knows how many appliances she does a month, but she's been very successful. Uh, one, at helping her patients with sleep apnea, and two, uh, building medical insurance and uh, building a very successful financially from a financial perspective practice. And uh, Dr. Hale is very generous in, in what she shares with uh, people that ask her. So she does have a service that's it's very reasonable and she does a good job. Um, I've provided her phone number there and her email address. And um, if, you, if you want, if you, if you have occasion, you want to talk to me, I'll be glad to, to connect you to uh, with an email invitation or what have you. And she, that might be the final step that you need to, to finish up the process. So um, with that being, being said, I wanted to, uh, again, thank you and look forward to providing another uh, helpful webinar for you in the near future. Thanks.